Welcome. This is the April 9th Jalen Zones production user call. We have Glenn D, Jan B, and myself, Michael D, at the moment. And as for some news, if you will be in the Seattle area, Doug, who has been frequently frequenting these calls, will be at the Linux Foundation Open Container Summit and the, uh, what do they call it? The Open Source Summit, I believe they call it. That's the 15th through 18th. I might drop in for the day from Portland. And I have a few topics for others who have not rolled in, so we can wait on those. But this morning started with a doozy of an article from Blocks and Files related to, let's see, Blocks and Files, and no one being abandoned, and or marooned is his term, with TrueNAS moving to... Debian. But there are some mighty choice quotations among all this. And uh, I don't know, one of them was, what if people wanted to push FreeBSD forward for the last 15 years, they would have. And 15 years ago, we had FreeBSD 7.3 with early ZFS integration and 8.0 had just landed. I don't know if he's referring to NextBSD or TrueOS. And uh, I don't know, if Netflix is pumping out, what, at times three quarters of evening U.S. internet traffic using FreeBSD, I, I don't, I, I suspect something has innovated in the last 15 years. Do you have any thoughts on this, gang? Well, there's more to an operating system than just send file. <laughs> okay. And yeah, FreeBSD evolved quite a lot. Uh, so evolved quite a lot, but not uh, into a mass uh, product where basically people have been installing it and using it as a daily driver without even thinking about it. Is 2024 yeah. the year of the Linux desktop? Do you uh, count Steam Decks? Maybe. <laughs> That case, uh, just look at the numbers. Uh, how gaming under Linux has taken off, but only for uh, yep, yeah, that's oh, yeah. the Valve handheld console. It's ah, yeah. basically Arch Linux with Wine. Cool. Packaged and pre-configured so that it feels like uh, using a gaming console, unless you drop into the KDE environment, but um. The answer is that um, yep, their customers, so I systems customers, I expect want some uh, Linux exclusive features, like they want to integrate it with Kubernetes, they maybe want, or they think they want Ceph or similar products which don't work out of the box on FreeBSD. So for them, it's easier instead of porting these bloated software stacks to Basically say, yeah, well, someone else already ported ZFS to Linux, despite the objects from the Linux kernel developers. So we have a less um, cumbersome way to get both ZFS, which customers definitely want, and the Bling, uh, which we think customers want. Glenn. Yeah. Um... I mean, I, I honestly, I, I don't think that uh, uh, 2024 will be the year of the uh, the Linux desktop because, uh, I mean, sure, Linux, uh, you know, when we look at that point of view, you know, is getting better, but it's still um, uh, very fragile. You know, it, it is easy to install and, and break, you know, without you know <laughs> trying hard um and whereas what i look at it with when it comes to free bsd yes it's slower development um but it is consistent and i i, I think that that when we look at uh netflix and uh I think also WhatsApp is using FreeBSD for. Um, they definitely were. To, I don't know. Oh, they got was uh, hotmail, taken but... over by uh, Facebook, no Meta, and they're definitely a Linux shop. So they may okay. have migrated just so that they can 
eventually uh, kick out everyone else. <laughs> right. But. And and at least you know also when we look at Netgate and 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 their PFSense, uh, I mean they may also manage to to migrate to using uh, Current, um, and you know that has shown tremendous uh, performing ga uh, gains. Um, over fourteen or over what we were doing before when we were, we were stuck on twelve for a long time. Yeah, two two point six was stuck on on twelve point two for a long time, and then they they uh, pulled the uh, um, the long run with with actually migrating to to uh, the current, um, yeah. and that means uh, PF sends two seven CE and and also their plus uh, that that was with twenty three point one I think it was. Mm -hmm. Uh, they had migrated to to current, and now they're tracking current. Um, yeah. So the problem with thirteen was for them as a router um, platform, but the, is that in thirteen a bunch of things changed under the hood for the better in the long term. But thirteen point zero had a few regressions uh, in the routing socket. It's mm. good with or, or, well, at least uh, unintentional changes. It wasn't that things weren't possible, but basically quirks you could do before no longer worked like they did. It is, I think they weren't quite sure if it was um, intended to work like what they were doing mm -hmm. because they were doing things in ways which were definitely not documented, but used to work for years. And now the uh, question is, yeah, can we fix it? Or do we have to be back compatible? And it wasn't a major thing. It was just enough to be easily caught by a regression test and it was but because it was such a niche issue oh. it wasn't obvious how to go forward and what was the actual underlying cause yeah well there will always be bugs and if xz is reason to stop using unix in all its forms then well stop using unix welcome dave what's going <laughs> on on a closed source operating system, we wouldn't even have known about it yep. until it was mass exactly. exploited and exactly. someone traced it back. Instead, we got very lucky to have it be detected almost immediately before it could spread. Thank you, Mr. Postgres performance person. Speaking, uh, speaking of speaking which, which, yes. Uh... Of course, now now we are on 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 the gaming front. Uh, it's also worth to mention that uh, Orbis OS, which is the heart of PlayStation Four and PlayStation Five, is in fact a heavily modified uh, FreeBSD. Yep, the Switch uh, operating system also took a bunch of FreeBSD kernel code. Um, but um, the other side is of that is yeah, of course you. These days with the Linux Ulator, at least I tested it a few months ago, you can even run Proton on FreeBSD and install Steam for Linux if you are into pain and suffering and uh, don't need <laughs> slash uh, uh, USR uh, share or was it slash USR local? <laughs> or they were deleting by accident. <laughs> mm. If you uninstalled Steam. Anyway, just the bug in the uninstall script which wiped out most of your file system. Dave, any topics to discuss? You're muted. Uh oh, muted. Still muted. Oh, you're back. Hello. Yes, I've got some stuff on the uh, OCI container stuff that I've been doing. Um, oh, let's do yeah. it. OCI news. Yes. What you got? You go? no. All right. Let me get my notes. So I can paste in the link. Cool. Um, so there we go. Okay, that is the uh, edit link. So if you feel I've done gross injustice and you want to change stuff, you can just do the GitHub off and, and change it. Um, but I have another link for public public usage. Ah. But the guts of it is, um, for a variety of other reasons, I terraformed my infrastructure last week and removed everything. And I'm putting it back bit by bit with um, Doug's OCI jails. Um, and that 
first up requires me to go through and check that all the things I currently do, um, I can do with the um, OCI jails. So there's a big long list of to-dos there on the items I'm doing. Um, but the guts of it, it looks like it has everything I need um, to replace my existing, what were they now? These jails, these ones are, I think IOK, uh, no, IO cell, the shell script that predated IO cage. Um, so there's a, my old setup is a bunch of servers um, all over the world with IO cell shell scripts and some Ansible stuff wrapped around them. And over time, I've been slowly replacing these and the 13 to 14 upgrade has been the one where I said, I need to do this from scratch this time instead of just copying literally 10 year old infrastructure from one place to another. Amen. Um, yeah, so that's the, the guts of it here. Um, both Doug and I have been asking various bits of um, previously released engineering team and the Git admin team, can we publish these? And what I would like is that we publish sort of beta releases all the way through the 14.1 um, alpha beta release candidate cycle to use and get some experience from, from people like ourselves here on, on what using these containers is like in practice. And then if we have all the bits we need, just publish as is for 14.1 and if we don't have um, anything, um, if we do have stuff that blocks us, then we just have to fix it and go for 15. But I think we have everything we need here. There's a, two or three small things I don't yet understand. I don't fully understand about how to tag releases. Um, well, I, I know how it's done correct. I know how it's done with Doug's scripts. I don't fully understand how this relates to registries. Um, we'd like to build multi-architecture packages so this means you can sit down at any FreeBSD box and go, um, what is it, Podman pull FreeBSD 14, um, whatever, and it would fetch the right image whether you're on an Arch 64 or um, an um, or an AM, ARM 64 or an AMD 64 box. You wouldn't have to worry about the names. That's very convenient for me because half of my old stuff is um, is AMD 64, and my newer stuff is almost all um, ARM 64. Um, I need to understand signing better. Um, what I expect from release management's needs is they will want um, more make files that go into our FreeBSD ports, uh, uh, um, not, um, source, source tree, sorry, that will then generate the necessary images um, as files. So OCI jails can be exported as a sort of fancy tarball and then the release engineering could sign and publish those in the same way we do all of the other image formats on the website. And then people like me would be able to fetch them, upload them into other image repositories and users would then be able to know that the image is valid because it would match the checksum on the, um, uh, on the, uh, the normal sort of PGP signed release, e um, release announcement email. Um, other than that, I think I've got most of the stuff I need. The one last tricky piece, I figured out my IP addresses assignment today. So um, that requires some clarification. My current containers have specific IPv6 addresses on a private VPN, and that is needed. Yeah, get off, don't care. Um, and, and that is needed because there's things like clustered databases and clustered applications. So it's not enough for them to just be on a network, they actually need specifically to be able to contact, to be receive a, a, a predefined IP, IPv6 address. Um, and that's that seems to be possible. So the final thing remaining is that I need to make sure I can create a container and mount in the mutable data sets that have, you know, like the database files um, in them, and then I'm good to go. Um, yeah, so it's, it's, it's looking pretty good. Um, it's surprisingly fast. Uh, that sort of, I didn't really expect that, but um, when I compare it to fetching a tarball um, and uh, unpacking it and putting things in, it's 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 pretty quick. So the, the format is good. Dave, just to be super, super clear, you've used the word publish several times. Do you mean to have a registry, a kind of public repo that's curated? 
for all to use? Well, um, so it's uncurated, but for all to use. <laughs> yeah, so there's, there's two separate things here. One of them is, I think, the first stage for release engineering is to offline in the same way we build our, they build our current releases, is to produce the normal release artifacts we have for, for FreeBSD. And then once that's done, use the package base builders to build the um, resulting sort of official OCI tarball for FreeBSD. And that can be exported from the system that did the building um, to a file. And you can then publish that file on the same download.freebsd.org website um, as we would for um, our DVDs, our memstick images, all of that sort of stuff. And then anybody can use another um, Podman command. It's a tool, another tool from the, the, the suite that Doug's worked on to import that file into their system. Um, and that's a good first step. Um, what I would want as a second stage is that the FreeBSD organization itself publishes downloadable images directly. So you don't have the hassle of having to check back to see if there's a FreeBSD 14.1 P2 patch, um, of a, a patched image available. You would just refetch and it would automatically update it. Yeah, so cool. two stages. Um, in the context of OCI stuff, there's this word registry, which is, um, I think of it as a fancy web server that also supports sort of key value tagging of things. So you can say, fetch me the latest version of FreeBSD, and it should figure out for you that you're on an ARM64 machine, so you probably want the ARM image, not the Intel one, and you just ask for the latest one. So that is now 14.1 um, with whatever patches are necessary, and it should just figure that out for you automatically. So that's really what a registry is. Got it. Yes, thank you, because that's... Terminology yeah. that is not in our little circles here, sorry to say. So, um, yeah, we'll keep engaging or poking various people in release engineering to figure out what is and isn't possible in what time frame and what's required. Um, and hopefully, hopefully we get there for the 14 release cycle. Do you have any um, blockers or it's just enough hours in the day to get to it? Oh, yeah. Um, How can we help? Rephrase. Yeah, I think what would be useful is to have someone in the release engineering team say, yes, I will help you make this happen. I know the things. I know what's required. So, um, uh, yeah, I, I think we've had some uh, a degree of change in our release engineering team over the, at the end of last year, and things are maybe a little bit unsettled. But we need Do you to have a liaison something. with RE? Not, not, not a response yet. So I, I talked to um, Moyne, who looks after the Git, is one of the Git admin teams. This is a, de a slight digression. And when we publish packages, um, not on our website as tarballs, but as native, um, native OCI uh, container registries, um, there's a GitHub one. And that seems at the moment to be the simplest one because the FreeBSD organization already has a presence there and we can publish our images directly there. Um, it's not, yeah, our packages are very fancy tarballs. Yeah, we, we, we defined tarballs, didn't we? Yeah, we made tarballs. Um, um, uh, where was it? So, so we, we could use that GitHub registry to, pub, to, to make fetchable images for people. Um, that would be possible. And it's only really three steps. You build the containers, which you can do offline on FreeBSD infrastructure as a release engineering person. Um, uh, so build the container images, then you sign them and then you push them up to the registry with the appropriate metadata. And then someone else could just fetch them and as an unauthenticated person and they can check the signatures, um, check the, the hashes and then run them in a trusted fashion. Uh, so oh. pretty, pretty straightforward at the moment. So have you talked to Colin Percival at all? I, that would be my next job to email him. I was just checking in with Doug yesterday and today on okay. where we're at, and, and that's the next piece. Yeah. Cool. I've just asked Colin if he'll be at the 
events in Seattle next week because maybe we can have a quick kind of powwow with a mix of Zoom and in person. So yeah, so it, it Masters are aware of um, okay. uh, I've kept him and dug up to date on on, on my my progress um, for this document I linked. People should just have a look through and have a go. Um, it would be really good to know what's missing from that document, anything that's not clear. And I'm hoping at some point um, prior to 14.1, I can turn this into a document to go um, onto the FreeBSD website somewhere, maybe in the, um, uh, like in the handbook or something like that on how to use this. Is it safe to say you're working in conjunction with Doug right now? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd send him Fantastic. stuff all the time. Hey, is this wrong? And he says yes, and I fix it. Yeah. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Yeah. Okay, well, hey, that is great news. Um, Go ahead, Jan. You had a bunch of comments in chat. If I, I understand correctly, one of the ideas behind it all is that yes, you want to have a, you probably want to have a default FreeBSD uh, base layer for your uh, image stack when you apply all the overlays. But wouldn't it make sense to start out from the um, release tables uh, with, and then just package those? Uh, so yeah, you really I, unpack the tables, then uh, yeah, I, I take suggest the result have... and turn it into uh, an OCI uh, image uh, file, which is just another form of table. Yeah, um, maybe I can try something bold and share my desktop and I can show you what this looks like. Um, you may want to make sure um, if you're not that bold to only share a window. <laughs> oh, my stuff is pretty boring. It's mainly Unix stuff. So, uh, and IRC, yeah. So let's, let's share. I'll throw in one comment there, which is Clang LLVM. And it's immense yeah. size such that your average, uh, bump up that font size if you can. I'm going to do that. I'm awesome. just going to bring this doc here awesome. across awesome. as well. So I think that's what we want. Yes. Um, get rid of that one. Yeah, so what we're interested in here is we'll skip to the, um, oh, do I have the window from building? Uh, um, the... I just got rid of my window for building here. So we're still seeing stuff or did it? Uh, we, are seeing, we have the uh, web on the left. Two uh, quite high resolution windows, so it will not be yeah, readable so in getting... the recording. Yeah, so um, when we build an image, we're basically using Doug's repo here, which does all the hard work, and it builds a 14.0 release from the Reling branch using um, using the package base infrastructure, which means you don't just get vanilla FreeBSD, you get FreeBSD 14 P6, which is great. Um, maybe less relevant for jails and for kernels. Um, and it produces a bunch of images like this. So we can sort of see here, they've got like, you know, FreeBSD 14, the tag. And you'll notice that the latest image here has the same um, image ID. This strictly isn't a, isn't a hash actually, but these two match. Um, and then further down, we've got a minimal one. Is that a hash? <laughs> Isn't that Sorry? a truncated hash of the decompressed tarball? Um, I think it's, I'd have to look up. The ID is different to the hash. It's not the same thing. Um, and I'm not sure why. Um, I think because the ID is generated from the decompressed uh, tarball and then it's compressed and then hashed again. Maybe. Um, what do we want here? We want Podman. Uh, there we go. So we can just see a bunch of them there and there's, you know, there's, AMD ones, ARM64. So what Doug's done is he's broken them out. Um, tree, where are the guys? Are there yeah. just a few kilobytes that can't be? The, they are yeah, after DDIRP or snapshot or thin, or how did so, you get to the kilobytes? So just have a look at these here. That what he's done is the very bottom layer is just the M tree. Can um, you zoom so, in, Dave? That's pretty tiny, sorry to say. Is that a tiny font? Good Lord. Th these letters are like wider than the Danube now. Oh, really? Okay. Well, yeah. thank you, Zoom. Yeah. We can make it a little Beautiful. bit bigger. Okay. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So what we can see is this, um, ironically, small is actually the largest image, right? Um, ro just roll with it. So 
<coughs> the very bottom one is literally just the M tree data. So the checksums for final images and um, that's the base. And then we've got the, the static stuff like um, slash rescue in there. So if you wanted to run an image that is only going to be used to run, let's say a Go binary or Rust binary that has no um, runtime dependencies, you would sort of split your image off from that and use that and end up with just five megabytes of extra stuff. Um, the next one is base. I forget exactly what base has in it, but you can see it's not very much. And then minimal has a bit more. And then small, which is your pretty much your standard base.txz has another 112 bytes in it, 112 um, megabytes in it. But that's actually pretty good. So we don't need any of the kernel stuff in here. That can be left off. Um, and there's a few other things like tests and so forth that aren't needed either. And we take those out, we actually end up um, at, a, at a pretty good space. So like, a, I don't know what a, a minimal um, Alpine image I think is about um, four megs as well, roughly. So this is quite comparable for other, um, other Linux based um, operating systems um, or containers. Um, yeah, and so you can fork any one of these layers and then build your stuff off that. Um, yeah, that's all I really wanted to show there. And it's pushing and pulling is pretty straightforward. You just do push, pull, um, and I haven't done signing yet. Um, there's a really nice, well, not nice, there's a, a port called Docker um, Registry, and you can run your own Docker Registry on FreeBSD for that. And that's what I started off initially um, with. Um, but it's quite old. It's quite out of date. It's, I think, over a year or two out of date. It works fine, but it, it should be brought up to date um, before we sort of go public with everything. And then the rest here is information about setting packages up on uh, on GitHub and so forth. And if I do that right, uh, pack, oh, there we go, packages. We've got it here. Um, here's the images that have been pushed um, each one of these. Strictly speaking, I don't have to publish all of those. I could just publish the last small one. Um, and each one of them has a little bit of metadata in them. They um, package settings, you can, I've already attached these to a given repository. So it sort of inherits the permissions from, um, in this case, from my Skunkworks slash FreeBSD source um, repository. And if you go to that repository, you see the packages, these packages that have been sort of attached to it. Um, and if I undo that here, you can sort of see here, you can add teams of people to each artifact to manage it. That's kind of a bit silly um, in some ways, but um, each, uh, go back, packages, packages, where is it? Packages, packages packages each um, artifact has its own sets of permissions yeah so um, what I'm suggesting in the beta cycle is they let me just do this and work with someone in release engineering to hand this over to someone with the appropriate um, approved hat for the uh, for the actual final stages but it's really easy to set up it's one of these things we'll spend more time in email discussing what's required than just sitting down and doing it once those the permissions are set up um, you can just push and pull freely. Um, so that's how um, I pushed all the images up. I just ran Doug's script to build them. And then I just did a little list of the images, remove some other things that I don't want, remove this localhost prefix, which I don't want, and then um, use this command build a push to push the image up to the um, up to the repository, and that's it. Um, and they're pretty quick, you know, because they're only like a um, tens of megabytes each. Um, the next thing I have to do is build one of these with my um, custom. Um, how can I stop the sharing? Where's the D share button? I you already find. have. You have. You could. I oh, did it stop by accident. Did it? All right. Oh, Sorry. Um, so the only the next thing for me is figure out the volumes, um, the so the ZFS data sets and make my own um, images based off Doug, Doug's ones that contain um, the various database um, services that I need and figure out how to drop in two or three small configuration files with the appropriate sequence in them, and that's kind uh -huh. of it. Yeah. 
thank you for sharing that because it, you dug through all of the uh, complexity uh, of the existing uh, specifications to get there. Mm -hmm. So to answer um, your question, um, why wouldn't we build them off the base uh, uh, images? And the answer is because um, they're not updated. Because they're large. Um, we don't need tests. We don't need the kernel. Um, and this way, we can we we get up to date packages, nice and small ones. That's the last port update, um, Michael. But if you go back, you'll find that these are just Go changes, and it hasn't been updated in a year or two. Have you reached out to them? Uh, no, not yet. I just tried to see it's if it's still a maintainer. So yeah, yeah, that's maintainer. So create oh. an issue and uh, well, it's one of these things. Point it out. To the maintainer with a patch. Um, it's just another Go library. Cool. Yeah. Very cool. But Great if work. If you want to try it, I would strongly suggest don't run a local container um, registry. Just use the GitHub one. As far as I can tell, it's free, um, and it's uh, delightfully easy to use and, and nice and it's... fast. And that's Not maintained that by Docker folks or FreeBSD? That... Go ahead. Um... It is that uh, I don't want to be dependent on something which only a few big players can host. Uh, so if both GitHub and Docker Hub decide to uh, play the game of uh, let's <coughs> try to uh, extract some rent from this and come up with the idea that, oh, these uh, Amazon S3 uh, outbound bandwidth costs look mm -hmm. enticing. Uh, I, I don't want to be beholden to them. Yeah, the registry stuff is actually quite neatly set up. You define your primary registry, and then you can have these sort of mirrors. And because it's all checksum based, um, it'll just try one of them until it finally works. So it's clearly been designed for people who are working in a corporation behind a firewall with private images, but sometimes they want to fetch public ones and it should just do the right thing. And it does that. So there's um, there's a file called containers.conf. Have I written about this yet? And what's the no, link to that no, repo that you're aiming awesome. people to? Um, I will. Can't get there if we can't get there. Yeah. They okay. need to find it organically through oh. my docs. Yeah. Okay. Posted cool. on my home router here, my underpowered Oh, okay, home. cool, cool, cool. Um, oh, so you're pointing to, you're suggesting people try your repo just to get going, correct? Well, they can try their own, they can do their own stuff. It's oh, like five minutes to set this up and push them. And we're the sort of people who should try that. Um, uh, containers. And registries. Um, oh my God, we don't want all that guff in here. Can we just get rid of that grid? Oh, we need a little bit more than that. Um, How much yeah. guff? Oh, this, it's got too much comment garbage in it, but um, can I find my ones? Yeah, that's what we want. Uh, cool. Yeah, that's what we need to do. So, Containers I, or Docker? I'll just share this this again. Share the massive. Yeah. Uh, and share the left window. Yeah, so I'll, I'll yep. make the form. This is the registry file. Um, and basically, you've got this unsecure choice that says, when you say, get me FreeBSD latest, it should try these three registries. And the risk for that is someone name squats and you end up with something terrible. So we don't want to do that. Um, and so here's my default registry. Um, that's the GitHub one that just works. Um, I've also used the Oracle one um, that works too. And it will just fail over from this one to that one automatically if the other one isn't available. Um, I did put a local registry in here as well, um, but I removed that. And that's really all there is to it. There's a lot of stuff cool. in this. Yeah, there's like hundreds of lines of Yeah, but that's things. a heavy lifting, though. No? Yeah, but they do all the work for you. So you don't need to worry. You can run your own one, and you can have your stuff spread out over two or three um, untrusted providers. Could you drop uh, that seven lines into the document or chat? The two I, I will, and I figured out how to make paste. this thing work. Okay. So the prefix thing should allow you to give a meaningful short name to this rather ugly long thing, but I failed miserably at that. Um, and I've joined the Podman um, IRC channel in the hope for someone to to enlighten me, yeah. No, I started using Podman and everyone told there me it's is. like the next big thing. 
yeah. uh, compared to Docker, and it fixes a lot of the problems. And I used it, and then I realized, like, okay, they fixed the problems that they thought were important without fixing the actual important problems. It's like yeah. Linuxism all over again for me, you know? So I, 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 then I was like, okay, okay, now I am absolutely sure that I don't want to do anything with the OCI at this point. So, <laughs> and uh -huh. after idling for like a month in the OCI chat and the uh, Podman chat, I'm like, nope, definitely not my thing. I'm just going to make my own format, which is basically, it's called the tarball. So, yeah, <laughs> so this is actually really, really funny. This is the bit I haven't explored yet. But, um, um, Anthony? The tarball. Oh, yeah. Dave, what was your thing, quickly? Yeah, um, I think that there's two things. For me, the amount of code that's in these tools dwarfs my application and business code by miles, and I'm mindful that keeping this up to date and working in itself is a massive effort. Um, and what I'm interested in doing as, as a fallback is the OCI container format is really simple. It's just a tarball with another metadata file in it. And you could build those by hand if you wanted, but more to the point, the builder tool from last year will still work this year to produce those formats. And all you need to do is unpack them into place, which you could do with a short shell script. So uh, yeah, in, in the back of my mind, what I wanted originally was to be able to put my containers in tables on a website and have package fetch them for me and unpack them to let me run them. And this is not that different. Yeah. Anyway, Jan, um, over to you. If the things I wanted to bring up is that uh, I looked into that design space as well. I did not follow the same path as you. I went down what existing code can I reuse in FreeBSD. And um, so the lib package, uh, which is the core of FreeBSD's yeah. package manager, already has a, bu has a bunch of features which I didn't know about. The most important for that is uh, the package triggers. So you can have a UCL configuration file, which can basically match a glob of paths. And whenever the package manager modifies those paths, uh, it will then run a Lua script uh, and tell it what uh, the, you have been matched, please do something. Mm. And packages can install these kinds of uh, triggers which means that something like a, a portman port could uh, install a trigger. And then when you install something in a blessed default directory for um, images, it would just be notified by the package manager whenever the files are modified by the package manager so that you don't even have to wait for it to show up or pull for it or whatever. And then, um, the other thing is that uh, I spent some time considering, well, the OCI specifications are set in stone. We are not going to change it. But if you are looking at just FreeBSD again, and in our own little happy world, um, yeah. there we have a few more options in the question, especially now that we have package-based uh, repositories, and it has been blessed by the release engineering team that we are going to keep this working going forward is that um, package base allows us to quickly fetch the base system from packages and have custom packages for a jail where you would basically use the package manager inside the jail to yeah. maintain the base system and any dependencies and maybe even your custom configuration, which would normally be an overlay instead could all be one meta package, which just depends on the right versions of whatever you want. So you could have a pa package which is just a list of dependencies uh, and then install that inside the jail. Yep. Well, Dave has his motivations and reasons. So And D Dave has yeah. a valid use case, and it yeah. would be really great when if this all works. But my um, apprehension is that this will work for a while, and then Nobody wants to maintain the complexity because the complexity is what takes maintenance. Mm. And as they've described, just the infrastructure is bigger than all of his application logic. So uh, you will spend more time maintaining your um, 
fancy abstraction when actually your code, uh, which solves your business case. Uh, I can see both arguments. If everyone contributes to and works together to keep the big stuff working in collaboration, yeah, then such tools are and are useful. But if you have to struggle as the small platform which gets ignored by uptime changes and you can't rely on anyone else to uh, unbreak right. it for you, then it gets problematic. Well, Dave, are you comfortable with the maintenance burden for the part you've bitten off? Oh, yeah. So I think, firstly, the docs are valuable and it's been an interesting learning pattern to go through it. I think I, I've probably been involved in FreeBSD now for um, around about a decade or so. Um, and the main thing I've taken away is it's worth putting the effort to find things that are simpler. Um, the other, I think the other takeaway is it's much easier to use code that someone else is maintaining. Um, with that's libraries like XZ or, or Lib, uh, LibArchive. LibArchive is really a FreeBSD project anyway, but um, all the infrastructure is there. And what we're saying here is, couldn't we do this ourselves with some shell scripts and another web server? And the answer is totally. We totally could do this. And I talked with Doug last year um, about this specifically and decided it made no sense for me to spend time and money building my own set of shell scripts when this is already exists. So little things like how do you handle registries? How do you handle package lookup so that there's failover? That is a non-trivial problem to solve and they've already done that. And at the end of the day, when you run a jail via Podman, you get a jail. It's just a jail. So the runtime complexity is exactly what we normally have. It's PF, it's ZFS, it's, um, it's normal FreeBSD stuff. And what these tools give us is the, the the plumbing allowing us to package and ship things around in a standard way. One thing that's not at all obvious here, but I think is entirely possible, is you could have a, um, a Go or Rust project that would cross-build a binary for FreeBSD and create the jail from GitHub Actions. So all on the, the current Linux tooling, they wouldn't need a FreeBSD thing. And for many of our um, open source projects, this would be a massive change for us, being able to have upstream push a container and for a downstream person to give that a quick test without setting things up. And I think it's a really big advantage that's not not necessarily not, not obvious initially. Yeah. Can so in short, you know, get up actions with a Linux build, cross build the binary for FreeBSD and then create the FreeBSD container because all it needs to do is fork the FreeBSD base image, copy in the binary, and then push it back up. Um, and that's really awesome. It makes um, a lot of our CI problems become a lot simpler. Yeah. For those who haven't heard the phrase, could you touch on the sort of die Jenkins die aspect on, of this? <laughs> I'm tired of Jenkins. <laughs> I'm tired of Java security vulnerabilities that require rebooting public facing services and I'm building my own <laughs> slowly, very slowly. Yeah. I've, I'm, I mean, uh, in, in our company, yeah, we ended up using BuildBot for those who don't know what BuildBot is, is a, it, it uses um, Python, Python declaratively. Yeah. It's, it's a very neat way to, to and it, it's actually more like the Gen 2 of CI CD engines. It's like a, meta CI CD engine that helps you to build your and many large companies use it like uh, Apple uses it internally they actually have like multiple versions of them depending on which project in Apple it is um, I think LLVM uses that and then well, a whole bunch I think even Gentoo itself uses it which is kind yeah. of ironic um, and uh, well, we've been very happy with it like I wrote a, a jail plugin for it and a jailer plugin for it I'm not sure if my team has published that in PyPy the Python uh, package manager, but basically we tell it run jailer, execute this command inside of it, and that's it. You know, and it creates a jail on the fly with a jailer and does whatever it needs, it needs to do. So um, you have those, but they're not public. I'm not sure if they are public. I know that my team has done some uh, patching, and they worked. I think at the time it was uh, Mohammed who was the maintainer. 
uh, FreeBSD, his, his BOFH on uh, the FreeBSD account. And uh, yeah, so we sent some packet, uh, patches back and forth back in the day uh, to make it work even better on FreeBSD. And we've integrated the uh, Slack and <coughs> the things like that. But the interesting work part was having a jailer and jail integration in BuildBot. So like our our methodology for that was we we like that Linux has an ecosystem. We just don't like the ecosystem itself. So yeah. let's build our own ecosystem. You know, I want an ecosystem, just not your ecosystem. It, it was kind of a very weird way of, of doing that. Uh, but the, our ecosystem is nicer. I'm going to be, you know, with, with BuildBot and, and Package and Poudrier and all of that. It, it, it was much nicer compared to uh compared to the um uh, the, the linux ecosystem of github actions and stuff like that well dig uh, that link up buddy i will i definitely will and i'll ping my team otherwise see... vaporware yeah yeah anything um, else on oci containers we've covered a lot of ground um, yes I, closely related and that is uh, while you still have the chance dave uh, consider the zfs uh file system layout you want to put in place for it mm -hmm. because uh, during all of my more or less crazy experiments with ZFS and, and jails, uh, I found out one thing which I, in retrospect, regret about the usual way I've done it for years, years is that um, I used to just create the ZFS uh, inheritance tree between uh, parent and child data sets like it looks in the file system. So yes. the, that basically the, you have a bunch of starting points and then the ZFS full uh, uh, data set tree looks just like the file system. Interesting. I think for jails, we should aim in the direction of having similar to what we do for boot environments, have one empty unmounted placeholder in the VFS inheritance tree for the jail, which is unmountable, and then one underneath for each type of data set we have inside of jails, and then the mm. rest goes under that. So you would there place your base system or your, in the Linux terminology, persistent volumes will then be under, let's say, data there. So you would have my pool, jails, then the jail name, then the type, and only then the instance of the type. And that recursively then, because that means that the uh, MFARL code or whatever you have there, your uh, OCI image, once you uh, apply all the overlays, uh, is not the parent data set of your persistent data, because once that happens, you have to untangle this uh, tree to um, recreate the inferior parts and preserve the um, persistent parts. Yeah. But if you, um, you can have them mounted into each other because that's what you need and it just works out like you expect it to if you set the mount point property uh, correctly so that you don't even have to have a mount point configured per data set it can inherit the right uh, inherit the right default it's just that um, yeah hmm. yeah I, I think that is one of the things that isn't really easy to touch so the hmm. sort of container bit is, is, is cross-platform so the linux um OpenZFS setup uses the same arrangement and it's basically keyed by like a graph structure. So it indicates the, the parent, the child and the container that sort of links it all together. Um, mm -hmm. I think it has some kind of type. And yeah, I don't have one at hand here to go, how easy is it to work out where the, where the, where the container is and what's in it, but it's not, it's not hard. And most of that stuff you actually provide on the command line at the container instantiation time. And yeah. that would probably be yeah, a, a problem have a to solve for the uh, container storage thing. interface <laughs> plugin. Hmm. Sorry? That would probably belong into a, a CSI driver, container yeah, storage maybe. interface. Yeah. But the uh, configuration for runtime containers is done when you go you know, podman. 
uh, Podman Pool or whatever, or it's, it sets it all up then. Oh, anything else on OCI container layouts and ecosystem? Is there a song? Is it like Podman, you know, like David Bowie converted to? Oh, goodness. Uh, Sousa <laughs> would have a video. It would be pretty good. <laughs> like uptime, uptime funk. Eh? So uh, any other topics before a few words about IPv6? And of course, topics, Jan, like the ARC management, maybe we can touch on that in the ZFS call. Yeah, let's do that tomorrow. Cool. So here's a super quick update. I belted out. A lot has taken place since Sunday. Antoinette and I banged away on something I'm calling nonsense, which is a FreeBSD-based router without PFSense or OpenSense. And uh, we got a whole bunch of uh, IPv6 working, and I'll let you read this link here. It's in the doc there. I can drop it in chat at your leisure. However, Antonig, you've got some IPv6 questions while we have all these folks. Yeah. The yeah. My, my two questions for the day were, 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 was, were, were. In time um, zones, don't worry. <laughs> uh, if so, when I was using zones for uh, we, we actually deployed multiple uh, uh, open what was it um, Omni OSs Omni OSs for our customers. Mm. Uh, we noticed that zones support boot environments, as in like not the host but the zone itself also has a support for boot environments. I was wondering, has anyone tried to have? So I, I we've also started using uh, DCH's uh, talk uh, enemy of the state. Um, which was all about how to do jailed data sets. Very interesting stuff. And we've been very happy with it. But then it got me thinking, can we also have boot environments in jails? Because there are boot environments in zones. Obviously, the methodology and everything is different. But uh, that, 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 I don't know if anyone has ever done that. And because package now also supports... Wait, does package support boot environments? No, FreeBSD update supports boot environments. Yep. You, but the code right. exists in the zone shell. And yeah. Go again. That goes back to the question of do you want the jails to be internally or externally managed? Right, right. Yeah, of course. And of course. I would argue for external if you are in any way or shape looking at a container like mm -hmm. workflow. But that's uh, the thing. In case of um, zones, you have a single utility for packages and the OS mm -hmm. is the PKG utility, IPS. And IPS has an integra integration with uh, a boot environments. Now, if it's on the host, it manages the boot environment of, of the host. But if you do PKG-Z and you give it a zone name, it will manage the boot environment of the zone. So from, uh, I was wondering if like, because we do have FreeBSD update-J for a jail, mm -hmm. but it, Internally, it converts it just to a path. It doesn't actually... No. The package-j actually attaches to the j. So the package process uh, goes into the jail using jail uh, attach and then runs jailed. Uh, no, 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 not the package process. I'm talking about the FreeBSD update utility. FreeBSD uh, update-j... Yeah, there you would do... Uh... I don't know how free this update is, but I always use JXAC to run it inside a jail if I actually do it. I yeah. don't think I, I'm, I, I don't think it does a JXAC of FreeBSD update in a jail. It, it what I you do, do an external JXAC and then run the command inside the jail. So you're running FreeBSD update inside the jail? If I used to, I no longer do, but yes. Okay. And the there, I, I've never tried to use it in a delegated uh, ZFS delegated jail. I would be curious if there's some kind of lockout to Booty prevent environment. it from failing, or if it just if the if it has the right compatible pool layout delegated, if it would just auto trigger detect that it has the right pool layout to look like boot environment capable, okay. and then just does it. I've never okay. tried it like that. Okay, th that okay. sounds like a homework for me. I'll, I'll dig into this because actually Faraz wrote the code for FreeBSD update dash J and FreeBSD version dash J. I'll talk with him and see how he did it. And then I'll look into the code of FreeBSD update to see how it does the boot environment stuff. Because um, that would be And also look into the base system BECTL tool, not the old yes. external port, but the C code is yeah. based on it. Yeah. 
Yeah, with, by, with, by, by the way, I, I don't know why we never merged B Adam because B Adam, the port utility, is way cooler. Like it can do really cool things. License, maybe? No, no, it yeah. was written by Vermaden and it's in the BSD. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, I think we just rewrote it. Thing. What's missing from the one in base? Uh, I assume they just wanted something <laughs> small that works. Yeah, B Adam is a very large code compared to BCTL. That that is true. Yeah. So that was one of my questions, um, and it looks like I just opened the homework for myself. And my second question, when we were working with uh, Michael's nonsense, uh, the router, not not his, uh, his uh, <laughs> not not his community life. Uh, <laughs> we're working with Michael's <laughs> nonsense. On the nicely uh, done, nicely done. <laughs> We, we, uh, I, I had a very good observation, which is, uh, we, by the way, we configured it this way. We have DHCP CD on the WAN, which does prefix delegation, assigns it to the LAN. And then on the LAN, we do a router advertisement and everything works flawlessly. Android, Mac OS, FreeBSD, everything worked fine, including the jails that are attached to a bridge. So that also worked fine. Uh, no problems there. However, my question is, can we do WireGuard over IPv6 with prefix delegation in Slack? Um, okay. Not directly, doing... but... Huh? Sorry. There are ways, but continue. Sorry, yeah, because... Do... No worries. So in my home, I do it with Hurricane Electric, which means the prefixes are static. There, I have no issues. I just assign the WireGuard interface AIP. I assign my laptop WireGuard interface an IP, and I'm good to go. But I want to know if I can do Slack over WireGuard, because we don't know what the IP is, because we're doing prefix delegation with uh, Michael's ISP. That's my only question. Uh, and Jan, I think you have some ideas in here. So, um, OK, you're trying to solve the easier use case. Uh, um, in that case, only one side of the WireGuard uh, configuration needs a stable DNS or IP address. So WireGuard already, uh, the WG command already looks up uh, host names when it configures the interface. Uh, the downside is that it only news, does it once uh, and uses the first answer. It doesn't probably do go through multiple answers and retry them until it finds a working configuration. But so you can use dynamic DNS, even if neither side has a, a stable IPv6 address. Oh, I don't mean that. You, you're but meaning the wire guard is running on IPv6. Yes, wait for a moment. The other thing is okay. every wire. So that's just finding each other on the internet so that you okay. can have a wire guard tunnel which mm -hmm. works if neither site has a stable address. The other thing uh, I've been messing around with and got it working is you can have a little helper there. Let's say you have an MQTT broker and the nodes just uh, push signed uh, state messages where we say, these are my external IP addresses and ports. And you just send that to an MQTT broker per uh, basically yeah, and that then takes the role of the next type resolution protocol in a DMVPN um, kind of setup. Uh, you could even get this working with the scripting available on something like a Microtech router so that their <laughs> MQTT client is capable enough mm -hmm. of that so that you can have them basically, oh, my peer is down. Let's retry what I've received via MQTT. And then or, oh, my DIN DNS uh, changed. You don't even need DIN DNS. Oh, I know my external address changed. So yeah, you. the downside is that all of this is networking related. So you kind of have to poll to find out when something goes down. Uh, because without sending test traffic, you don't know if your peer is reachable or not. Mm, so yeah. But so you can easily use something like IF state D, run one state machine to, per peer, and then just ping them every few seconds, and when they're down, we reload the DIN DNS. So that would interesting be even simpler. Interesting. It makes sure that you are basically connected at all. The other question is, um, from the kernel's point of view, a WireGuard interface is a point-to-point -point IP interface. Uh -huh, so exactly. They are free only. There is no Ethernet or other crap underneath. 
um, which is both a problem and a blessing in disguise because that means that you don't need uh, any next hop. You only have to throw an IP packet at the using an interface route at the mm -hmm. interface. And then inside of the WireGuard implementation, you have something they call a uh, crypto ring uh, routing, in, yeah. which is very useful, even if it is a nasty layering violation. But the idea here is that the interface configuration has for each peer uh, a non-overlapping range of uh, IP addresses routed yeah behind this interface to that peer. So whenever a packet is sent to that, uh, it gets matched against this list of non-overlapping IP ranges. If there is no match, the packet is discarded. If there is a match, it points to the public key of your peer. So in your WireGuard configuration, you always have to have the public key of your peer. Okay. which you can also use to derive a ULA address or whatever kind of address you need. So you could okay. just use a truncated hash of the public key uh, as the, for example, uh, ULA address or some slash 64 or whatever prefix length you want yeah. to statelessly hash the public key <laughs> to its yeah, UI64 equivalent uh, for wire, right? That's the thing. I am able to assign ULA addresses on my laptop and Michael's nonsense, and I can ping each other all fine. But after, but what I want to achieve is get a, an IP address, a publicly routable IP address from Michael's nonsense. Mm -hmm. Okay. The problem here is that uh, WireGuard is not multicast capable. Yeah. So the that it doesn't care that it's multicast because it only knows unicast. It treats everything as unique. As long as mm -hmm. you have a point-to-point -point tunnel between two peers, yeah. it will just pass the multicast traffic through. But you can only have one recipient per multicast address. So if you have a point-to-point -point tunnel with only two endpoints, uh, you can just configure the all address for IPv4 and IPv6, and the traffic will move through. Okay. But the question is why you would not just really have something like a designated endpoint. So the what I think would be the easiest way to do it would be just to have basically a link local IPv6 address, which is well known, mm -hmm. a small set of well known link local addresses, which okay. are then the address servers via unicast. So basically, you connect to a HTTP server just so that it's easy to. Uh, Integrate okay. with other things, and you connect. It tells you your unicast address. Ah, uh, so because let's you say, always have link local. Yeah. Uh, you use the link local address just like uh, NDP, just for this strange okay. kind of point to multi point. Okay. Okay. And because so, you can't have multicast, you have to have multiple servers if you want redundancy. Yeah. Yeah. And then so, that just works. So, so I'm assuming the easiest way to do would be this. So I run a prefix delegation on Michael's nonsense yep. for WireGuard interface. It ran, it got a publicly routable IP address. Great. Okay, that's step one. Step two. Wait, it only got a prefix so far. Yeah, it only got a prefix. Okay, and you know, DHCP CD. You do have a prefix. So DHCP CD exactly. executes your uh, hook script. Yeah. Which will now assign an IP address. With that prefix. Yeah. Okay. So now I assign an IP address to the WireGuard interface itself. Let's say uh, dead beef column column one. Now that is uh, 2001 dead beef mm -hmm. column column one. Now that is Michael's nonsense WireGuard interface. Great. Okay. Then on the WireGuard interface, I also have, let's say, a, uh, a previously known ULA address. FD, whatever, whatever. Okay. Use, that's uh, use link local that solves the problem of having address collision at all because then it's implicitly okay. scoped to the interface. Okay. So I have a link local address on the WireGuard interface. Okay. Great. Now, on my side, I have also a link local address. And as soon as I'm connected, I send a request to Michael's nonsense, let's say on, a, on some web server, which asks, okay. 
which prefix am I using? Or let's say, or even better. Uh, no, that's assign... a good idea. Just only uh, send the prefix and derive the public key either from configuration okay. or from the hash of the public key as default. Okay. Okay. So based on Antronic V's uh, public key, it will generate a publicly routable IP address. That's going to no, get it added. Will generate the host ID part to go with the prefix to form a global unicast address by just okay. concatenating them. So you okay. put the slash 64 prefix, you get via DHCP prefix delegation, which is okay. delegated on behalf of that interface. Okay. You make that uh, available so that you just have okay. a dumb as possible HTTP service, okay. which just shares via this link local interface, yep. that link local interfaces, um, IPv6 prefix, mm -hmm. and then you can uh, append to that whatever you want. And depending on what's in the allowed IP uh, settings of each node, either they're it's tied down or not. That's what they're, I want to say. So as, as uh, last step, now I I change Antronic V's allowed IP address mm -hmm. uh, uh, and set to it to, the... to include that. OK, and then on Antronic V's computer, uh, that's going to get added as an interface IP as well. This is all very beautifully, can be done very easily. The only problem is fucking macOS doesn't support post up, post down on the macOS client. Uh, what? Um, it does not. But I think if you're up to um, digging through uh, the XML uh schema specification, you will find out that LaunchD can have service files. Uh, yes, of course. Which respond to interface uh, state changes. Ah, um, so, so I can just do so that. So you can only, respond yeah. to interface state changes. Okay, and, oh, okay. very um, other smart. Things, so there you can do things um, to have just, it's not WireGuard related. It would work for any kind of network interface yeah. on a Mac. Yeah. So you don't need anything WireGuard specific. Yeah. And the that other thing is that I think even the macOS client supports the pre up, pre down, and so on hooks uh, in the uh, WireGuard configuration. So you no, could use... it, I think it doesn't. We tried that. Uh, I tried. Could you try that. there? Just have a stupid default search path or something. Uh... It doesn't find the commands you always want to use. I mean, the thing is that the, the, the Mac app, the Mac app itself, uh, if I type in, let's try something. Here we go. There's Dexter. Oh, it could be if you install the App Store that it's running Sandbox. And as far as I know, anything. yes. But if you that's install it clear. yourself, uh, it may work yeah. like you want. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's the thing. The, the WireGuard, oh, if uh, I... Even if it's running Sandbox, as long as you can write to a file inside the Sandbox, Something else could have a file, uh, code that's ugly as sin, but it something <laughs> else could uh, have a file change notification on that file inside to then notify on the new prefix. Yeah, yeah. Let's see. Let's see what what Jason's website says. One sec. One sec. Come on, computer. You can load this. Where is the description? There we go. WireGuard is fast, modern, secure, VPN tunnel, blah, 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 blah. Please visit WireGuard.com for summary. God damn it, Jerry. Um, so yeah, okay. I need I need I need to have a look at this because this would be the interesting part. If the Mac OS uh, app can do it, probably even if it can't, it's fine. I mean, we can use the WG utility directly. You know, it, it is in uh, Mac ports and packet source and brew and fink and whatever Mac OS has these days. So um, yeah, there we go. Uh, uh, okay, yeah, okay, fine, fine. I'll think of that. No, yeah, that's a good idea. So I use link local or ULA addresses in order to um, reach a previously known, um, let's say, an HTTP server. I get the prefix. I can generate my own address because, you know, I can make it based on the hash of the key. And then finally, I, I, uh, I assign it on both ends. And now I have a United States IPv4, IPv6 address that is not blocked by Google every time I try to search something. Because for some reason, they keep asking me CAPTCHAs when I use Hurricane Electric. So asking what? CAPTCHAs. CAPTCHAs. Oh, right. OK. Every time I use Hurricane That's Electric. To be expected. It's, it's a very stupid, the... I mean, 
Yes and no. Um, you bots, I know, I know. It's very annoying if you're an honest user. It's understandable that because it's so easy to obtain them that people are wary of Hurricane Electric tunnel IP ranges because they are mm -hmm. often used but for low-key abusive traffic hmm. and evasion of rate limits and so on because on the internet, nobody knows that you're true to the power 48 uh, dogs. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. There's the t-shirt right there. Uh, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I'll use the WG quick utility anyway, so that should be pretty easy to do. And um, yeah, Jan, this was a very cool idea. Yeah, we already have a ULA subnet for uh, Michael there, so I just uh, run a server there. Uh, or I'll just do it with link local because I don't need ULA at that point. And um, then I just need to do a little bit of a scripting here and there and everything should be fine. Um, yeah, this is a very cool and neat idea. This is a very cool and neat idea. This would be very good to have a US-based IPv6 address. Um, I'm also thinking... Accurate. Jan, did I get you this ac get this accurately? No one knows you are two to the power. <laughs> Hope I get you accurately without having to remove some. Go ahead. Okay, so yeah, progress has been made on these fronts. I am delighted with this. And I'm very happy because I, I run Jailer in Michael's home and uh, I just did like Jailer and we added um, what was it? Accept, accept router advertisement or if you want to force it, you can do with Ruta Sol D. Uh, and uh, you start the jail and it has an IPv6 address and everything is working fine. It's, it, 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 it was very, very easy to set up and everything. And not to segue uh, into to tomorrow's call, but uh, ZFS sends over, well, WireGuard, then SSH, give you two layers of encryption. Well, what if you just reduce that back down to one? Yeah, like if we do IPv6 ZFS send over SSH. So now you have less layer of encryption. So it might be even faster. I don't know. We have to try. I still haven't benchmarked that. It will be very neat to see. Amen. Uh, One of the interesting things about WireGuard is because of the crypto ring uh, routing and that it's implemented on both send and receive in every implementation from the beginning. And as far as I know, nobody has gotten it egregiously wrong or something. So uh, you for the first time IP based access control is fine. You can yes. actually use MFS v3 with host based authentication to authenticate actual hosts and not yes. IP addresses. Yes. <laughs> oh, interesting. Because yeah. because uh, as long as you whitelist single IP addresses uh, on your uh, WireGuard nodes for the inside address, so the allowed IP is really a list of IPs and not zero slash zero yeah. or something, then uh, only that IP address is routed to that public key and anything, anyone else sending from another public key, even on the same interface, gets dropped before the kernel even sees the packet as on the interface because WireGuard will just say, that's not a valid en encryption packet. So discard it before ever handing it to IP input. So you can cryptographically tie IP addresses to public keys. Yeah, hmm. not to not to I turn this it. into not to turn this into a networking call, but if if a network infrastructure enforces 8021x authentication on the on the on the network, doesn't that isn't that true there as well? No. That's kind of that would no for that to be true uh on the link layer, you would have to run something called MacSec, which yes. is mandatory access. That's completely different. It out uh, the one X basically authenticates either the port at all, so that ah, to turn that port for, on, okay. or the MAC yeah, yeah, address yeah, yeah. on the port. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so then you that. can, um, yeah. depending on the but settings, the really, it, can free BSD as long as the, someone does something MacSec? like sorry. Can free can free BSD can free BSD use MacSec? No, it's not implemented yet, as far as I know. Uh, uh, even on Linux, it's uh, niche, niche. Yeah, the name is right. Uh, Red Hat has Red Hat has it in their distro. They okay. ship it, but it's it's it's. Uh, what you can do on FreeBSD is you can 
do various kinds of IPsec, yes, but does not protect the Ethernet underneath, but that's not a big attack surface. If you configure it statically, you can even prevent that. So you could do something like configure, if you're into pain and suffering, you could go the route <laughs> and uh, use static ARP or neighborhood uh, discovery caches. So yeah. that you can't spoof that then, or do some other kind of craziness there, or you just accept that someone who is able to spoof you at the switch level, as in bypass the whatever access control the switch implements can bring you down because we're probably uh, a few meters away from unplugging the mm-hmm. cable anyway. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then you could uh, basically con- use IPsec to require IPsec transport mode encryption uh, for everything local and use uh, an IPsec tunnel interface as your default route to the outside. Um, yep. Because FreeBSD has something quite nice that instead of the mess which Linux had with, they had a longer, but they took three attempts and still still haven't solved it correctly. Where so that you can use uh, virtual tunnel interfaces for uh, IPsec. FreeBSD has something called IF underscore uh, IPsec, and to implement that in FreeBSD, an IPsec policy can be scoped at three levels at the global level where policies normally live, at mm-hmm. the interface level where uh, an IPsec tunnel interface policy lives, and uh, especially interesting for ZFS replication at the socket level so that you can attach IPsec policies like I require IPsec encryption and decryption mandatory can be attached as two constant configuration lines which don't even require templing, they can be thrown at lib IPsec, applied to uh, a TCP socket, and then the kernel will ask something like strong swan or whatever is speaking uh, PFTV2 uh, with it. Please establish a session key for me, uh, and then it starts using that, and until then it buffers or drops the traffic. Yeah, that, that's so, that's very interesting because, like in our data center, we use we have a, we have optics mm-hmm. as an underlay, but we use WireGuard as an overlay, right? So mm-hmm. even in the same data center, a host-to-host connection goes over WireGuard. We have our own overlay. It's, it's a, yeah, it, it it seems like an overkill, but like because no, it's a multi. No, it's it's a good idea because it's so flexible. If you can hit your performance uh, goals with it. It's a very good idea, and it has a bunch of advantages over the hardware accelerated alternatives mm-hmm. like VXLAN with extensive yes. fancy switches. And how many different route types for MPBGP? I don't. I've lost count. Yeah, <laughs> and and that that fiber plus a uh, wire guard is looking working like has been working if for years now for us. But my problem has always been if um, let's say I am. Uh, mm-hmm. let's, say, let's say if an attacker got into one of our hosts and they okay. want to connect to an NFS on another host. Now, it, the authentication NFS? between... The, yes. Or NFS. Now, the, NFS, yes. Now, the authentication yeah. between hosts is done properly. However, inside the network, maybe he can change his IP address of a jail. No, if he, he has can't. Not on a wire guard unless... Uh, basically, the policy is symmetric. So every node applies the same allowed IP ranges to all... Okay. Uh, received and transmitted packets on its side. And be, so basically the policy gets checked both by the sender to not accidentally send crap. And the receiver and, to not accidentally uh, the receive receiver. it. And yeah. But, because but that, uh, be, be, you because... can't spoof your source IP on a WireGuard interface. No, not on a WireGuard interface. intentionally okay. allowed. That's the thing. Now the host to host is WireGuard, but from a, let's say from a, from a, from a from a, I don't know, an application jail to the NFS jail that's going over WireGuard, but it's not on the WireGuard interface. The WireGuard is allowing a range and a range, right? It's allowing yeah. this is slash 24 with this slash 24. Okay, now, so my question was, can I have, I mean, is it even a smart idea to have WireGuard literally on everything? The host, the jails, the VMs, you know, like um, ev- do everything on WireGuard. Pushing it as far to the edge as possible is that you can also uh, 
make use of all the computation uh, capabilities at the edge. Mm -hmm. You don't have to have a big VPN node somewhere. You can use everything you have, all the clients, whatever. The downside is that you also, uh, oh, but for WireGuard, that's a given. You can't make use of uh, hardware offloading features, but there are yeah, no so, hardware offloading for features for WireGuard. So with WireGuard, there are mostly advantages until you hit the point where it becomes so many devices that it's annoying to uh, manage. The other big advantage of having lots of tunnels is that uh, it gives you enough flows because one of the problems with any kind of VPN is that it kind of hides the flows inside of the VPN by design, which mm -hmm. can mean that, for example, if you have just one VPN tunnel of almost any kind, uh, on the NIC, for example, it may all go for a single uh, transmit and receive queue because it's all the same TCP flow or UDP flow okay. or whatever you're using. And if you're using multiple tunnels, so you'll get um, good load distribution. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. um, it, it does. It does sound like an overkill. Point where you have too many flows and yeah, yeah, but that's it, it, I mean, realistic. Yeah, I mean, let's say if, if my own application host, I have 10 application jails and all of them need access to NFS. Does this mean like I need to make like, you know, each jail would have its own WireGuard interface connect to the NFS jail, so which is on the other host? What you can do uh, in FreeBSD 13.2 and newer, mm -hmm. I think. Uh, yeah, 13.2 and newer, you can have the host configure the WireGuard interface. Yeah, I'm past it. Yeah, that I know. That I know. And then move it over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Be yeah. aware that there's no protection stopping the super user in the jail from extracting the configuration, including the of course uh, client uh, private key. Yeah, but if if the other end is configured properly with the allowed IPs properties, then it will drop it. You know, if 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 an attacker yeah, exactly. actually. So I would yeah. uh, really. I haven't written it out, but um. I would really look into just doing something like some kind of message broker. And I think the best uh, match for this would really be MQTT among the common protocols. So I generate it's, everything centrally and then the brokers no, get the information. No, you have, you, you, decently, you have a controller which is somewhere and then you have multiple not, replic not uh, synced brokers for redundancy purposes. So that you don't have one high availability MQTT mm -hmm. service, but you have like three of them. You uh, all the rights are replicated to every broker, so that it can be a dumb and feral thing if you reboot it. All state is lost. It's basically a distributed up cache if you want. But there you then have it apply the policy that who is allowed to basically claim what, or you have a proxy in front of it, which does the rights, but mm -hmm. the readers could be as simple as a Mosquito uh, subscribe type into a shell script, and mm -hmm. then it reads all the messages um, and gets in near real time, so milliseconds uh, or less latency, uh, Rep gets notified about all of the um, changes, and if a connection is dropped, it reconnects and relearns all the things. Then it con applies the Mosquito. It's, uh, okay. Is there an MQTT would... client? Uh, sorry, an MQTT server in Erlang? Oh yeah, there is EMQTT. Multiple. <laughs> and there, but e I would e just use. Yeah, I go on. I recommend you just use the small little Mosquito server Mosquito, for this okay. because you don't need the big enterprise access control, uh, multi-master replication. All of that gives you complexity, maintenance, overhead, and um, just performance problems. And because not to sound this, dumb. Uh, application uh, use is so simple, you don't need it. You can just have multiple MQTD uh, basically servers running independent without high availability. Over availability the LAN or over the WAN? Because, hmm? Over the LAN or over the WAN? 
or both? Uh, I would say I run it over the the, the uh, underlay network, okay. whatever that is. Mm -hmm. The fiber uh, cool. outside of the VPN, or run it mm -hmm. over the fiber via with TLS client certificates. Uh, one of the nice things is that both the Mosquito library and server, unless you build it without, support support one of the things which is sadly vastly underused, and that's TL, uh, TLS with password authentication for clients. Yeah. So that you uh, authenticate by the way, uh, with can API curl, tokens. Yeah. Can curl do MQTT? I'm wondering, because it would be very neat to use, uh, you know, just curl. No, curl. but uh, the Mosquito subscribe command I mentioned is basically that. Uh, there's also, there are three variants of it. There's a publisher, there's a subscriber, and there's a uh, request response client. Okay. It's three okay. commands, but it's all a trivial wrapper around the API. Okay, so, so, if, so if we come back to Michael's nonsense and IPv6 issue, that I want to have an American IPv6 on my computer, right? If I you would want not... to turn that into a proper product, yep, run an MQTT broker, which yeah. listens on each WireGuard interface, yeah. loopback address, yeah. have yeah. a small set of them and try them until you find a working connection so that you get yeah. availability like that. So um, I would run an MQT, MQTT broker on Michael's nonsense on the router. And what would I use on the client? proxy to one because it's TCP. You could just proxy it uh, mm -hmm. with IPFW, uh, just forward the TCP connection yeah. to the actual yeah. broker. You don't even have to run one, but that's yeah. only important at scale. But it can be useful if you want it, for example, to... Oh, yeah, there, there is a use case for that, for the IPFW forwarding. And that is mm -hmm. because you can have the, um, have the broker running in a jail. Now we're back. Let, me bring, let me bring it this <laughs> way. So I'm, I'm, <laughs> if I'm thinking and, this way, like if I'm thinking web, I'm thinking server Nginx, client curl, right? If I'm thinking, yep. okay, if I'm thinking MQTT, what, what would be the server and what would be the client? Um, Mosquito for the server. Mosquito is uh, the writing it themselves a bit funny. Uh, with okay. a double T and so. Oh. Mos yep. Um, it's available as a port. It's very easy to put in a jail okay. because yeah. it can really run as a single uh, executable and five library jail without a user land if you want to. So it is an interesting test case. Uh, you can extend it by writing uh, your of. Um, Basically, your access control policy can either be configured or uh, you can write it as a shared library if you want to against an API. Then you can implement arbitrary authentication hooks. It's, yeah. And it what does, would be, that's, that's, that's Mosquito. The port for it no, also no. includes clients. Ah, so there's also... It's um, one, per, it's one oh. port slash package for both. Okay. And there are alternative implementations. It's not the one to one, Got it. but for command line testing, uh, for GUI development and so on, there are a bunch of uh, MQTP, uh, sorry, MQTT uh, client applications for GUI operating systems. Uh, things like MQTT Explorer, MQTT X, uh, which uh, are useful because they can, uh, you can just subscribe in them and then you can have them show you the whole tree view and flash whenever something changes. I wonder. I wonder if I can use um, what was that Erlang project? Um, a Rabbit MQ. Does it support MQTT? Because it used to be AM. Uh, AM. It used to be I think AM. They have a, a, because it's all everything in Rabbit MQ is a plugin, and there is an MQTT plugin. So similar oh, okay. to how they, uh, it doesn't support all the fancy stuff which is possible via AQMP because mm -hmm. it's a less complicated problem. Ah. Uh, sorry, less, less complicated protocol. Uh, protocol. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Okay. I still have to look into the difference between, because uh, I know I know what some of the things that MQ, MQ, AMQP okay, can do. I know some of the things that AMQP can do. The thing is that MQTT can do, yeah. MQD, uh, Let's uh, with MQTT, uh, the application is basically in control. You do not have the whole complexity of having to have a dedicated message broker administrator set up the mailboxes and routing and so on. Yeah. Instead, it's just uh, because of that, it 
is not that well suited for an RPC style mm -hmm. uh, where you do request response and fan out and so on. Instead, it's just publish subscribe with a few mm -hmm. extensions. You can easily use it as um, as a message broker for a request response.